I thank Mark, of course, his wife Tracy, Lola and Maggie, who are also here, which is so wonderful. It's a privilege and pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, also here today, and Mark has spoken of him lovingly and proudly too, is my husband Clifford Alexander, not only my greatest supporter, the love of my life, father of our children, but also, and grandfather of seven, I should add that, uh, but also he is a true and outspoken champion of civil rights and of gender and race equality. So, we did have the cover up here a little while ago. Maybe it'll come back up again at, at some point. But I wanted to tell you something about how and when and how I came to write this new book of mine. And tell me if I'm not speaking enough into the, uh, into the mics, but okay. Um, Princess of the Hither Isles, a black suffragist story from the Jim Crow South. Hopefully, I can also provide some challenging thoughts for you to ponder concerning race, gender, and power, the magic words that Mark also put into his introduction, or the lack thereof, in politics in particular, in the past and maybe in the present and the future too. Perhaps you'll think, as I do, that my book and Adela Hunt Logan's story, which it tells, have relevance for our thinking and our actions in the realm of electoral politics today. Even as we celebrate this year's centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution that gave women the right to vote, and we definitely should celebrate it, this is an important milestone, there's a lot to think about concerning its importance and why it was so difficult to achieve and possibly what more reforms our country should consider instituting to ensure or even to restore, in some cases, the blessings of the franchise. But let's start with Princess itself and how far it goes back in my own life. Around 1980, a young scholar came to my house because she said she wanted to talk to me about my grandmother, Adela Hunt Logan. She is the subject of this book. Adela, she told me, would be an integral part of her doctoral dissertation. She'd been a suffragist in Jim Crow, Alabama and worked diligently, although unsuccessfully during her own lifetime, to get women the right to vote in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. I'd heard some, but not all of her story from members of my family as I was growing up. Adela was the person for whom I was named, which gave me an ineradicable tie to her. And even now, her portrait hangs on the front wall in the hallway of my apartment. But after hearing a good deal more about that, from that long ago visitor about Adela, more than I'd previously known, and after reading her feminist tracts about women and voting that Adela had written, I had at least one nagging question. In a place, that place being the Deep South, and at a time, the post-Reconstruction years leading into the height of the Jim Crow era, I asked myself, when virtually everyone around her must have believed and reinforced the message that she was ineligible for or unworthy of the vote, both because she was not male and also because she was not white. So why did Adela so passionately, so hopelessly, advocate gaining the right for all women to become enfranchised. That question nagged at me, and I began writing myself, writing, among other things, about my grandmother, who died long before I was born. In 1983, Ms., and uh, for those of you who don't understand that title's significance, I'm some, sure that some of the older people in the audience will understand its significance. The younger ones may not. Um, Ms. was at that time the country's leading feminist magazine geared to a general readership. It had been founded and it was edited and produced by Gloria Steinem. So Ms. magazine published an article that I submitted about finding my paternal grandmother. The editors wrote this about me. This is in 1983, remember. Adele Logan Alexander is working on a book-length biography of Adela Hunt Logan. Okay, 1983. 
Well, it's been a long journey and it's taken lots of time and lots of detours before I finished that book length biography last fall, but I continued doggedly pursuing that intriguing political activist, that little known, outspoken black woman who looked white for whom I was named. Okay, hold on now. I've introduced another factor into the mix. She was a black woman who looked white, I just said. How does that perhaps contradictory, even oxymoronic phrase complicate this story? I don't have enough time fully to explore that element. But let me just say that it reinforces the fact that race, as it's been defined in the United States, has always been and still is far more a legal, a cultural, a social, an economic construction than it is a physical or a genetic reality. That construction was established by the founders in our country's earliest years, and it's been kept alive by their descendants for the purpose, albeit complicated purpose, of maintaining the hegemony of a propertied, mainly white, mainly male power elite. Now, this has not been the same in the rest of the world, but in the United States, the rule and not the exception is that a single drop of colored blood which is an absurd concept in and of itself, has relegated the bearers of that so-called stain to be subject to all manner of discrimination and disadvantages. And why did Adela look white? Well, it comes down to genetics more than anything else. All of her male ancestors had been Caucasians. Her female ancestors, on the other hand, were African, African American, and Cherokee or, over the generations, people of so-called mixed blood. Those familial relationships are intriguing in and of themselves, and an addendum to that, remember, it was not until 1967 that the United States Supreme Court, in the case of Loving versus Virginia, determined that interracial marriages could no longer be forbidden any place in the country, throwing in a little Supreme Court for you lawyers here. Um, because of her mixed race ancestry, Adela looked like a white woman. Again, I wish we could get this, the photo of her up on, on maybe we can. Anyway, not, a, not important if we don't. Uh, the female members of her family, the Hunts, were among the Deep South's few, very few, and anomalous so-called free people of color. I say anomalous because their freedom was severely limited by both law and practice. Nonetheless, they definitely were not enslaved, as were most African Americans in their region during the antebellum years and through the Civil War. The Hunts, therefore, had a few advantages that those who were held in perpetual bondage did not have. Adela was born in rural Georgia during the Civil War, at which time her father was a slaveholding Confederate officer. He was, I believe, despite legal prohibitions in that state, officially married to Adela's mother. The ceremony itself had been sanctified by one of Adela's grandfathers, who was himself a judge. Ella, Adela grew up there in relative economic comfort and security. She learned a college degree and later a master's degree from Atlanta University, and by so doing, she became one of the South's most highly educated women of any racial or economic background. And as might be expected, she became a teacher. Her educational achievements notwithstanding, law and practice combined with her own unyielding sense of self-identity, made Adela officially a colored woman. But she definitely didn't always play by the rules that had been determined for her, both by her legally determined Negro identity and by the laws and especially the practices that were supposed to pertain to women as well. Officials in Tuskegee, Alabama required that the colored residents of Booker T. Washington's famous Tuskegee Institute, where Adela taught, lived, and raised her family from eight, the 1880s through 1915. The town officials required that they travel in and out of town via a designated back road. My father, born in 1909, by the way, was the youngest of Adela's nine children. But as for that prohibition on using the main road, Adela refused to do so. She drove her buggy down the main thoroughfare. 
The town also demanded that residents of the institute adhere to the prevalent state and local Jim Crow requirements that reinforced the demeaning requirement that all colored people must use rear doors, segregated water fountains, public toilets, and other facilities. But Adela refused to do that too. Because she looked white, citizens of the town of Tuskegee often found themselves at a loss as to what they would do about her and her egregious misbehavior. And the African-American officials at Tuskegee Institute also found her behavior provocative, troublemaking, and out of line. But she did not want to accept the most insulting aspects of the racial status quo. That presumably egregious misbehavior spilled over into her activities in the women's suffrage movement. She attended segregated conferences in the Jim Crow South <clears throat> by masquerading as a white woman. Excuse me. She became acquainted with giants <clears throat> of the movement, such as Susan B. Anthony and Carrie Chapman Catt. They didn't know what to do with her either. So in most cases, they reluctantly played along with her charade. Adele's goal, goal was to meet and engage with the movement's power brokers, to learn a lot about women's disenfranchisement and the efforts to end it, to gain the suffragist support for the efforts of African-American women such as herself, and especially to bring back to her friends and colleagues the information she gleaned and materials she collected, and in turn, to educate them. She was hardly alone among African-American women who were interested in and eager to obtain the right to vote. Such women of color paid little heed to the rebuffs of white women. They organized among their own in cities and towns throughout the country and especially involved themselves in the pro-suffrage activities of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. Are you shaking your heads and thinking now, what a fruitless masquerade to pass for white and thus betray her race? But I think not, and I don't think it was a betrayal. She did help to educate her people, especially African-American women, about political issues and the importance of the suffrage. She did write with passion about the injustices black women endured because of their political disempowerment, about the import of voting for women of the race. She disseminated these political thoughts in words that resonate even today. Let me read a little from her essays that date back more than a century. Her treatise from 1905 began thus. We should heed President Lincoln's words, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. But those requisites are only partially realized if women have no vote. If we are citizens, why not treat us as such on questions of law and governance, where women are now classed with minors and idiots? If white Americans, with all their advantages, need the ballot, and they do, if it has helped them as it has, how much more do Negroes need the defense of the vote to help us secure and maintain our rights? She continued, the main components of personal sovereignty are wisdom and power, and the greatest power any people in any democracy have is that which they exercise at the polls. Few women, especially colored women, can claim that vital indicator of civic empowerment. This writer, however, knows many of her own sex, a number of them Negroes such as I who are prepared to assume the responsibilities and rights of full citizenship. And those rights include casting our ballots. A few years later, she wrote an article titled Colored Women as Voters, in which she said, every day, increasing numbers of colored women study civics, but are convinced that their efforts would be more telling if they had the vote. The fashion of saying, quote, I do not care to meddle with politics is disappearing rapidly among these women because politics meddles constantly with them. <clears throat> more and more colored women are participating in civic activities, and women who believe that they need the vote also believe that the vote needs them. We should remember to reread our Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. This much is certain. We Negroes believe in equal justice, regardless of race, color, creed, class, or sex, and we eagerly await the day when the United States truly shall have a government of the people, for the people, and by the people, including its colored women. 
She further urged rural black women to petition their local boards of health, their state representatives, even United States congressmen and senators to demand essential services. Such recommendations, however, were considered troublemaking, and she worried that she might only be exhorting the South's neediest, most vulnerable, and often illiterate citizens if they could honestly claim citizenship status at all to tilt blindly at windmills. And she was also sometimes demeaned by white leaders of the suffrage movement. For instance, she hoped to address an annual convention of the National American Women's Suffrage Association in 1900 in the nation's capital. It was an occasion that would celebrate Susan B. Anthony's 80th birthday and would be highlighted by a reception at the White House. One of Adela Hunt Logan's white friends and supporters wrote Ms. Anthony asking that Adela be included on the program for that occasion, but Susan B. Anthony, who seems to have had a conflicted views in her attitudes towards African Americans, responded, quote, if I knew that your protege would astonish the natives and make the most biased Anglo-Saxons feel contrite, I'd invite her, but I cannot have speak for us, a woman who has even a 10,000th portion of African blood, who would be an inferior orator in matter or manner because it would mitigate against our cause and perhaps disadvantage her race as well. Miss Anthony continued, a few of our new recruits are Southerners. And I hope several such congressmen and their wives will attend our event. Thus, for me to bring straight from Alabama and seat on our platform a simple woman who is almost an ex-slave, either would anger them or make them laugh. Let your Miss Logan wait till she is more cultivated, better educated, and better prepared, and can do our mission and her own race the greatest credit. Well, needless to say, Adela did not attend that con conference, and therefore she did not get to go to the White House. As to what exactly her, mis, her reaction to Miss Anthony's letter may have been, I can only speculate. And frankly, I do a lot of speculating in Princess of the Hebrew Isles. So after hearing some of Adela's experiences and some of her own words, I expect you'll agree that she was one bad sister. Yes, she was an agitator par excellence, but you also may understand why I thought it was important to tell her story and to share it with others. And it does, of course, have resonance today. We have conflicting political efforts that surround the granting and protection of the franchise even now. On the one hand are those who argue that so-called cheats will sully the vote by casting multiple ballots or by casting them in incorrect polling places. That contingent argues that a failure to radically cull voter rolls will allow anyone to cast a ballot in the name of a deceased person. Illegal aliens and felons, they argue, might corrupt vote totals and skew the outcomes of elections. Students, they fear, might vote twice at the universities they attend and at home as well. All reliable an analyses show that these conspiracy theories have virtually no statistical basis in truth. Far more serious in terms of numbers are those who feel compelled to remove from the voting rolls people who represent the opposition. That faction also tries to include to intimidate potential voters by threatening legal or economic retribution. They try to limit early voting, shorten the hours that polls are open, and cut down on polling facilities. Similar efforts have purged hundreds of thousands of voters by imposing exact match requirements, such as the misspelling of a street, the omission of a hyphen, or the insertion or deletion of a middle name or initial. Such minor errors can result in having to cast contested ballots, which may or may not be included in the total at all. You may know that the st state of Georgia a couple of years ago, in a closely contested gu gubernatorial election that was most likely decided by such restrictions and other demands by one of the candidates. And that one candidate was both running for office himself, and he was concurrently playing the critical role of election referee. I can't imagine that the Wildcats would tolerate without serious and strenuous protest any such biased decision making for their basketball games. So today we have a related but somewhat different situation from that which Adela faced in the early 1900s when she pr protested the almost total exclusion of women from the franchise as well as the egregious restriction of voting by black male Southerners. 
Reconstruction's 15th Amendment supposedly guaranteed the right to vote by all African American men. That wasn't really a difficult decision for the late 1860s Republican politicians to make. They knew that to the extent that they voted at all, the vast majority of such men would continue to support the party of Lincoln, as they did when they were allowed to cast their ballots in 1870. But the 15th Amendment specifically did not include women. It also didn't specify that property holding couldn't be a prerequisite to the vote, nor did it provide that naturalized citizens could not be excluded from the franchise. Nativism, which involves a conglomeration of beliefs that so-called outsiders pose a serious threat to the integrity of the body politic, has been a recurrent argument against embracing such people into the electoral process. <clears throat> In the late 1800s and early 1900s, following ratification of the 15th Amendment, rigid literacy tests, property, residency requirements, so-called morality clauses, poll taxes, grandfather clauses, white primaries, and the like, specifically targeted black men and reinforced the maintenance and retention of white men as the country's power brokers. The physical intimidation of black people <coughs> who tried to vote, in many cases, was the rule rather than the exception. So those were the circumstances under which Adela Hunt Logan penned her treatises about the importance of the vote to a democracy, and especially the importance of adding and including black women as an integral party, part of the body politic. In recent years, many Southern jurisdictions, there has been an extraordinarily high turnout of black women and that has often decided elections. These women, though sometimes not entirely happy with their choices, have carpooled, babysat for one another, canvassed, trudged from door to door, watched polls, prayed, baked pies, fried chicken, and always tried to register new voters. They understand, as Adela had, the critical import of exercising the franchise. I think of those women in the context of what my grandmother advocated more than a century ago, and I know she would have been alarmed by the ongoing efforts at voter suppression that we still see today. But she also would have been pleased and proud of what women such as she were and are doing to contribute to the integrity and the vitality of the electoral process. So now, in 2020, as we should, we're celebrating the centennial of the 19th Amendment's ratification, but we must think about the fact that voting rights for women only came about in the context and at the time of the impo imposition of brutal Jim Crow restrictions. Those restrictions followed in the wake of the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which itself was ratified half a century before the Women's Voting Rights Amendment. That half century, 1870 to 1920, that's how long it took to get an amendment ratified that purportedly guaranteed that sex would no longer be imposed as an impediment against women voting. On the other hand, many people still argue that it is unnecessary, frivolous, or duplicative, but certainly it's worth mentioning that the United States, technically it's the ratification by three quarters of the individual states, that the United States still have failed to ratify an Equal Rights Amendment, which presumably would invalidate any and all remaining discriminatory provisions that restrict women's rights. But what about black women specifically? Arguably, arguably it was not until the press passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, one of President Lyndon Johnson's signature achievements in civil rights. And I must inter intervene here to say that on our wall in our study is one of the pens from the ratification, from the signing by Lyndon Johnson that he gave to, that the president gave to my husband. So it was only the 65 Voting Rights Act that gave black women any serious assurance that they would have the right to vote and be able to run for office. And if I may go back to what I reminded you of a few minutes ago, what we may wonder and ask, are we to think of the renewed and the ongoing efforts right now 
to limit and not to increase access to the franchise. That story certainly is not finished. Adela Hunt Logan died in 1915 with her most significant political mission still incomplete. You've heard some of her words, some of her musings. So I ask you in closing, what do you think she would have thought about where we are today and what we might do? Thank you. I welcome your questions. I hope I've challenged you so that you'll have questions to ask. Because I do everything for my mother, I'll run the microphone around whoever raises their hand. It's always the first one. There's somebody right back there who won. <laughs> And the story is just extraordinary. I think maybe today she wouldn't be as surprised as we would think she would be because it seems to me that race often um, a, trumps gender, so that she was still in kind of the Jim Crow, all that kind of stuff going on, even as women were trying to get the right to vote. And they spend a lot of time keeping us from voting, both, um, I guess not women anymore, but definitely people of color. I mean, they spend a lot of time keeping us from voting. Whenever I hear that black people don't vote, I'm, I always say, well, why do they spend so much time trying to keep us from voting? Um, so I, I think maybe she wouldn't be as surprised as, uh, I, I think she was amazing to be able to do the things she did, but I just think she wouldn't have been su as surprised as we might think. We've come a long way, but in some ways we have not come very far. It's, um, it, it's, it's still the, the project to keep the franchise from people, and that includes black people. What to do? Uh, you know what? I think that um, that black women are at such the center of, you know, um, political path, polit being political and being active. And I think that that's what you do. And I think they're doing a great job because you hear a lot about that now. And I just think, you I know, agree. I, it's I, fabulous. I definitely agree. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what do you think? Do you think she would be a surprise now? I mean, do, you think she do I would think she'd be surprised? What do you think she would think now? I mean, what do you think she would think? Um, I think, I think that there was such a sense among the suffragists that getting that amendment passed was going to be the be all and end all and would, and would um, end discrimination, certainly against, certainly against women. But at the same time, I, I, know, I know where she was living, I know when she was living, I know how much black men were limited and intimidated about going to, to the polls. So I don't, I don't know how that would have, I don't know how it would have played out with, in, her, in her mind. Yes. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, you, you mentioned something um, about Susan B. Anthony and some of the things that she had said that were kind of revealing, I think. But just in terms of women gaining the right to vote for all women, do you think that it was a pretty obvious mistake to overlook incorporating all women of all races into the conversation um, at the time, and do you think it would have been different had she been a little more open-minded about that? Do I think that Susan B. Anthony was including all women in the conversation? No, ma'am. Do you think she would have been more, do you think that um, the suffrage movement would have not taken as long, maybe, if they had been more willing to in, engage more all women, basically? That it's, it's very hard to tell. One of the, uh, what they called, the suffragists themselves called the Southern strategy, very much came into play around, around 1900. A large percentage of the early suffragists sort of uh, cut their political teeth in the abolitionist movement but then by 1900, they saw what was going on in, 
in the South in terms of limiting rights of black people. And to pass an amendment, they had to have the votes of three quarters of the states. And um, Tennessee, a southern state, turned out to be the one that, that put this over the, over the top. So I think that they were, um, I think that they were of mixed feeling. I think that the, what, what disturbs me a little bit is that I think there is a, an effort to sort of whitewash the, uh, the inherent bigotry of many, many white women in the suffrage movement to pretend that because they believed in this, quote, progressive idea of voting for votes for women, that they were, quote, progressives in all, in all senses, which they were not. They were what they considered to be pragmatists. And I don't know whether if they had embraced black women more, uh, more thoroughly, that that would have moved it any faster. I, don't, I just don't know. We'll never know. Yes. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. And, it, and my question goes more toward the scholarly project you undertook in doing the research for this book uh, and the process of writing and discovering this history. So I'm, I'm, I'm a philosopher, not a historian. So um, I'm just curious about sort of how did you go about uncovering this history? Where did you find the sources? What was that process like? And a second part of the question is what, what was the most surprising thing that you discovered as you dove into this historical record? Well, l let me try part two of that first. I think the most surprising thing was when, uh, was perhaps that first introduction to Adela as a suffragist and reading her, and reading her words for the first time. I mean, that, that sort of knocked my socks off. And um, I mean, I always, I knew that she was a suffragist, but it was just, her, three of her daughters were very much, were my aunts, and they, and they kind of raised me. And I don't mean that my mother and father didn't, but they were, they were very much in, in and of the process because they didn't, nobody else had any children. So um, I heard a lot of, I had heard a lot of stories, but actually seeing and reading her, her words, I think was the most, amazing thing to, that, I, that I found. And the second thing was what I was just talking about here, which was to, you know, I mean, I think I had sort of a naive, a naive take on it. And I was, I was shocked when I found how much really overt racism there was within the, the women's suffrage movement. Tell me what your first, oh, how did I, how did I write it? Okay. Um, it was very complicated and very long, and it. I started out. I started out writing a straight history. Then I said, "Oh, maybe I'll make this into a novel," and and then I rejected that too. So I call it, in my mind, it's a memoir, and I think that um, I like that. I like that format, um, since I'm not actually in teaching in a university anymore. I can take the criticism for using my imagination and uh, making up conversations and things like that. But I, and, and I say in the, um, in the afterword to, to, the, to the book, I say, this is my truth. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't make up truths for other people's stories, but this is my truth. And it's a combination of stories that I grew up with, people that I grew up with, combined with an awful lot of hard in the archives and all that kind of, kind of research. There's another one behind you, sweetie. Well, I have to add my thanks to that wonderful presentation. Now I can't, I can't wait to get the book and read it. Good. I, I want to go back to um, something that this gentleman over here touched on um, with a very straightforward question, I think. Did your grandmother ever write or have reported to others 
about her feelings on the, the whole theory of eugenics that was so prominent at that time, because I think that's what I heard you yeah. express <clears throat> when you read that, that uh, portion from Susan B. Anthony. Uh, what I heard was that she was following, um, how shall I say, that she was following a very well-known and deeply believed theory that women of people of color simply were genetically unfit for certain things. That Susan B. Anthony thought that. Right. <coughs> no, I think that's right. <coughs> and I'm wondering if your grandmother wrote about that in any way. I have not. Um, I have not seen anything that she wrote about uh, about eugenics at at all. And it's but it's. It's it's something I'm I'm working on a biography of her one of her daughters now who who was a um, who was a very who was an important surgeon and physician in in Harlem and and so on and um, she worked for um, my aunt that is one of those who helped raise me she worked for years for many years with um, with Planned Parenthood and um, of course Margaret Sanger. Was one of the uh, was one of the the people who kept sort of shifting the the lines on on eugenics, and uh, there there was there is no question in my mind that these people who in some ways were were very well intentioned also had this very strong feeling that that people of African ancestry were were inferior, and the and the, the people who worked for Planned Parenthood, like, like my aunt, I believe, she, she really believed that this was something that was empowering women, which I, I agree. I think that's, that's what it was. But at the same time, you had the countervailing arguments within the black community, some of them, saying that we can't, we can't do, we don't want to do anything that would limit the number of children that women have because we need to increase the number of African Americans. And on the other side, white people were saying, ooh, you know, yeah, we want to give them choice, but we also are, are concerned about all of these lower class poor, poor people. So I wish that I had found something that Adela had specifically said, and her daughter, I can't, I haven't yet found anything that she has said about it, except that she's working her tail off for Planned Parenthood for women who want to control their, their fertility. So, no easy answers. <laughs>